Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dom. I'm Lily. I plan our company. We help company build web and mobile apps. We have been using React for years and recently had the opportunity to use um, React Native with ClojureScript. We're so happy to be here today to share our experience with you guys on how we use React Native with ClojureScript. So let's get started. So a client of ours, Centric, provides an iOS app for home organization repair and maintenance. They really needed an Android app, so they tried to outsource that to an overseas consultancy, but that consultancy was unable to deliver what they had promised and the project was scrapped. It became our job to deliver an Android app on a pretty tight deadline. We had about six to seven months to replicate an iOS app that has been almost two years in the making. Now, with all that said, we're web developers. We've worked with ClojureScript and React for years, and we just wanted to make mobile apps. So that was our perspective going into this project, and that is a, that is a context around this talk, because we think that a lot of web developers would really be interested in building mobile apps if they could use familiar tools. Before we begin, let's go through our goals in choosing the technology stack for this project. Our client has a tight deadline, and we want to move fast with the project. So the dev environment need to facilitate fast iteration. In order to move fast, we need to leverage our team strength. So either we're using the technology that we already know, or technology that we can learn pretty quickly. Having one code base to write and maintain between iOS and Android is a huge plus for us. It will help us cut down on time. And all of that wouldn't matter without good user experience. So it's got to be fast. At last, we want our app to last for years and grow, and not to have to rewrite it. So the technology that we choose need to have a really bright future. So first, let's take a quick look at Centric's tech stack. On the back end, we have a Datomic database and a Clojure web server. There are multiple Clojure Script and React web apps and an iOS Swift app. These different applications talk to the back end over REST, sort of. Uh, it's like REST and some Datomic custom syncing stuff and some RPC stuff, and each of the different apps communicating in slightly different ways. Um, so in terms of this project, we our, our first goal was to create an Android app using React Native and Clojure Script, and we wanted to fix a lot of the uh, data issues that plagued the iOS app by using a more thorough uh, solution, so we decided to use GraphQL for the data layer for this. The next step would be to replace the iOS app with the React Native Android app, port it over, and also use that same data layer that we used for the iOS app. And then eventually, we wanted to replace the REST-ish thing entirely uh, with this one data layer for the entire thing. Now, before we go into our experience you know, actually using these technologies for this project, uh, we should give a brief overview of what they are. What is React Native? Before React Native, most mobile apps were one of two types. First is native app. So that is something like Java, Objective-C, or Swift. The problem with that for us as web developers, it has a really high barrier to entry. We have to learn new languages, new tools, new APIs, etc. And it's also not cross-platform. The second type is web view app. So that is something like Cordova. It's basically a web app in native wrapper. The problem is that it doesn't feel native because it doesn't render native UI components. It's also slow, primarily because JavaScript renders the UI and run your app logics on a single thread. React Native is a hybrid between that. With React Native, UI renders using native components, so the app looks native. And because the UI renders on a different um, threads than your app logic, it's fast. You can write in JS, and this works on both iOS and Android. So you'll have one code base to maintain. With React Native, you can do anything that any native app can do, either through na uh, React Native APIs, or you can write um, native bridge to interact with uh, native API functionality yourself. This makes React Native a very compelling choice. 
On the left here, we have a React Native code within um, in JavaScript, and on the right is how it rendered in the iOS simulator. If you are familiar with React, you can see here that React Native looks pretty similar to React. The only noticeably difference here is that in React Native, you have view, which is something like a diff in React. We hope that with React, would satisfy many of our goals. React Native should make it easy for us to move fast. We should be able to bypass Apple and Apple, uh, Google approval with instant updates when we make only JS uh, changes. This also leverage our team strengths because we already use React on the front end web. So we're hoping that the team would learn React Native pretty quickly. We hoped with React Native, a lot of code could be shared between platforms. And because it is backed by Facebook, and not only used in production by Facebook, but also Airbnb, Walmart, Tesla, and many others, we believe that it's going to follow the same adoption rate as React and have a really bright future. If you have used React before, you probably know that on the surface, React looks very object-oriented and stateful. But underneath, it's very functional. And for that reason, ClojureScript and React work really well together. This is the same React Native code written in ClojureScript with Reagent. As you can see, it's much shorter and it's way better to look at. <laughs> we already knew that ClojureScript dev experience is better than JavaScript. But we also hope that the benefit would outweigh the time that we have to spend in setting up the project to work with ClojureScript. Our team is already using Clojure and ClojureScript, so this should help us with onboarding as well. We are also using something called Expo for React Native. Uh, it was formerly known as Exponent, and it's sort of a lot of different things under the same name, so it's difficult to define. So we'll just talk about some of the things that it does. So it helps provide a lot of uh, common functionality for iOS and Android, uh, like push notifications, native maps, social authentication, very useful things. Expo also provides a GUI and a CLI that obviate the need for Xcode or Android Studio. So if you have a Linux developer on your team, like we do, and they want to work on the iOS app, they should be able to do that with this. There's also an Expo app for iOS and for Android that should make sharing development builds as easy as sharing a URL. Expo also provides hosted infrastructure for instant deployments of non-binary changes. So we hope we could use this to push bug fixes directly to users uh, without going through Google or Apple approval. In essence, we chose to use Expo because we felt like it could bring, hopefully, the, the best parts of web development to mobile development. Now, our expectations with this were that it would help us with our fast iteration goal. Uh, we wanted to use the instant deployment feature in terms of getting things out quickly to users. And we also wanted the, to use the Expo app to make QA within the project a lot easier. We were also hoping that it would help with code sharing a lot uh, in terms of porting over to iOS by providing a lot of common functionality. We also use GraphQL. GraphQL is a query language for APIs. It's not a specification, um, but it's an alternative, or sorry, it is a specification for uh, an alternative to REST or similar things like that. It's not a binary format, it's not everything, but if you are sending structured JSON or EDN, uh, it fits into the same niche. Let's look at a brief example. In this case, we have a GraphQL server on the left hand side that's defining a schema and makes it available to clients. So clients can be mobile apps, web apps, other servers, whatever. In this schema, we have one type, a user. The user has an ID, name, email, and friends. Uh, bang means not nullable, and brackets mean a list. So in this case, a user has a list of friends. That list can have zero friends or any number of friends, but none of the friends can be null. Next, a client will send a request. This particular request is a query, and we're asking for me, the current user, we're asking for my email address and the names of my friends. 
And then the server will send a response with the correct data based on the request. So as you can see here, only requested fields are returned. There's no IDs for uh, your friends or, or anything that you didn't specifically ask for. Also note that the shape of the data returned is in the same shape as the query that you issued, so it should be very easy to understand what you're going to get back. Um, and though we won't do it right now, you could modify this query to nest you know, friends of friends and friends of friends of friends and whatever you want arbitrarily uh, to, to hopefully batch stuff into a single query. So we hope that GraphQL would help us with our iteration speed by allowing us to delegate a lot of the data management on the client side to a library, and also allowing the client to develop semi-independently of the backend. Like if the backend can provide a full-fledged schema, uh, then the client should be able to pick and choose what's useful. We also hope that it would help with performance a lot in terms of the mobile app by eliminating overfetching and by allowing the client to consolidate a lot of different requests into a single single graph request. Last, we're really, uh, we're really hoping that the ecosystem would be helpful. Uh, it's, you know, GraphQL is created by Facebook, also used by them, obviously, uh, used by GitHub, Pinterest, Intuit, and many others. So we really hope that the ecosystem around this would be beneficial for us, and we th also thought that it would grow at a pretty steady clip. Now that you guys know what each technology is, let's put it into perspective. We have here the React community, which is now a pretty big community, and a subset with a little bit of disjoint of React is React Native. We have GraphQL community. There are people who are using GraphQL with or without React. And uh, Expo community is even a smaller subset of React community. At last, we have our lovely Clojure Script community. Can you see where we are? Oh, we're right here. <laughs> um, our community is so small. We thought that this project would be cutting edge. For the most part, it, it was. There are some that turned out to be bleeding edge, and we got cut. That is why we're here today, to share with you the experience that we have learned the hard way. First, let's start with something nice. Transitioning from React to React Native was relatively easy. If you already know React, you are going to learn React Native very quickly. And because React and React Native are conceptually similar, React Native enables your web developers to become mobile developers. This is a great technology choice from a business perspective as well, especially in a small startup where you might have resource constraints. In a big organization, this could enable knowledge sharing between teams and enhance cross-team collaboration. React and React Native are fundamentally similar in concept. But in practice, there are tons of differences. First, you are dealing with a different JavaScript environment. It's not browser or node like what you might be used to. As a consequence, some JavaScript libraries that work on both node and browsers, like AWS SDK, for example, just don't work on React Native. This causes uncertainty in what you can do or what you cannot do because the knowledge or assumption that you bring in as a web developer may not apply to React Native. Things that you have learned to work well on web or on the node environments may not be the one that's worked well on React Native. From a broader perspective, user interactions are also different. On desktop, you have hover, click, on mobile, that is press, swipe, etc. On desktop, the point of interaction is crucial. So it is pretty small, and the user can be exact on where the interaction happened. On mobile, that is fingertip. So touchable UIs need to be a lot bigger and need to give instant feedback. Apart from small screen and different screen sizes, mobile also have dynamic viewport as well. For example, on desktop, you don't need to think about keyboard at all. On mobile, when the user starts typing, keyboard can take up to 40% of the screen. That becomes a problem. You also have portrait and landscape views to consider as well. As a good web designer, we need to shift that thinking to account for mobile, 
a good web developer will also need to shift that thinking on mobile to account for differences in user interactions. Styling in React Native is surprisingly a high learning curve. And I'm saying surprisingly for my personal view because I am a CSS nerd. <laughs> React Native doesn't have CSS. You need to style things with JavaScript object and it, don't, it doesn't cascade. Maybe you're used to doing something like this. That no longer work. There is no global styling. You need to style things in a reactive way via inline styles. There are no classes, there are no IDs. So something like Bootstrap cannot exist in React Native because there are no global styles. There are several attempts in making styling in React Native more like CSS, which give you an illusion that your familiarity with CSS is transferable. But in the end, you are dealing with a different environment and you shouldn't let that fool you. Having access to a programming language to style things is a really powerful thing. It's open up possibility of styling that you couldn't easily do before in a non-programming language like CSS. Plus, it's better to thoughtfully choose to in inherit all the styles that you want and not let it be dictated by CSS anyway. Back five or 10 years ago, being a front-end web developer <coughs> meant you need to know HTML, CSS, JS, and maybe jQuery as well. Then the apps got more complex and became single-page applications. So logic, you know, the programming and stylings were split into two jobs. As a company considering using React Native, you are going to have to think about how it's going to change your team dynamics. UI components should be composable and reusable. In React, components can be composable without styling because you can easily do it afterward with CSS. In React Native though, components need to come with styling because there is no CSS. You cannot do that afterward. Programming and styling are much more intertwined in CSS, uh, sorry, in React Native than they are in uh, React. For example, to see if a keyboard is active or to get the height of a keyboard to adjust the style, you need to use a React Native event listener. Also, Android and iOS came with their own default styles. So you may want to conditionally adjust style based on platforms and that requires programming. So programming and styling are unavoidably intertwined in React Native. On the plus side, you have a more sane API to deal with in React Native than in CSS. Remember the nightmare that you have to do vertical aligned in CSS? That is a lot of problem in React Native. But at least it still works the same on iOS and Android, right? We were led to believe, or maybe we led ourselves to believe, that uh, if we use React Native and we use Expo, and we only use components that work on both platforms, and we only use functions and APIs that work on both platforms, it will all work on both platforms, right? Uh, we were wrong. We had a working React Native Android app, so we wanted to try it on iOS. So I opened it in an iOS simulator. That's not a great start. Um, it looks like a validation error, but it doesn't look like a platform-specific validation error, and we're not even doing that. So uh, anyway. OK, I Googled it. Uh, well, there was one result. Uh, <laughs> Lily, help. <laughs> OK, so I'll fix that problem. Um, so once I fix that red screen, we try open it up again. On the left here is our working version on Android. And on the right is the iOS. I don't know how the circle became diamonds, and you can't tell here, but none of the buttons work. <laughs> On top of that, <laughs> we have the little panel here, which is collapsible. It works fine on Android. That is how it looked on iOS. <laughs> it was apparent to us that the differences between platforms are more than browsers, and we are sure that these aren't all the issues. So when you're getting into React Native, 
you have to be ready to debug things like this, things that aren't easily Googleable. Like, how do you Google things like this? <laughs> but um, if you have been using Clojure for several years, you probably stumble upon um, first-hand errors as well. But those have becoming less uh, frequent over time as a community grow. So we believe that it's going to be the same for React Native. React Native with Expo also has some notable limitations. And I think it's important to discuss them uh, to really understand the trade-offs about it before you choose to use or not use it with your React Native app. The root of the problem is that React Native itself is incomplete. There are tons of uh, native iOS and Android APIs and UI, and UI components that are not yet wrapped uh, with JavaScript and made accessible in React Native. Now, the plus side is that React Native is extensible. To add native functionality to React Native, you have to either know both tool chains uh, and know React Native well enough to write a native bridge to do that, uh, or you can use a library from someone who already knew all that. Uh, Expo provides a lot of this functionality for you. Uh, they provide a lot of native bridges, and th those bridges go a long way in bridging the gap. But to take full advantage of Expo, the only native code in your project has to be from Expo and from React Native. That means that most of the high quality React Native libraries out there are off the table if you want to stay entirely within the Expo ecosystem. So by doing this, we lost access to a good video player, good camera uh, component, good video pick, or any video picker, really, any document picker, file system utilities, like lots of things that we either need eventually or would be useful. Uh, now, we, we've been told that a lot of these will be provided by Expo in the near future, and we really hope that they are. Um, but, if, but if that doesn't happen within a timeline that works for our client, then we have to eject from Expo and lose many of the benefits provided by it. Now, all this is not to say that you shouldn't use Expo. Uh, using Expo is a trade-off, and for many apps, it's probably a great trade-off. Uh, however, as it currently stands, uh, the more mobile-specific functionality that you need for your application, the more difficult it becomes to stay within that sort of walled garden um, and not require additional native code. So Expo may not be a good choice for every app. It's just you know, a case-by-case -case basis, so determine it based on your requirements. So you might wonder what our dev experience is like using React Native with Cluster Scripts. So let me give you a little demo on that. On the left here, we have our um, React Native Cluster Script code, and on the right is the iOS simulator. As you can see, we're able to use FigWheel the same way as you would with um, dev web development. But it's not all that rosy. Prior to working with this client, I had set up a side project with React Native and uh, JavaScript. It took me a few minutes to get the project up and running. With ClojureScript, it took us two full days, two full days of trial and errors. As we put in the Venn diagram, the combination of React Native and Expo itself was small, and together with, React, uh, with ClojureScript, it's even smaller. The tooling was premature, and we ended up spending time debugging to make it work with ClojureScript. But in the end, we're glad that we went with it and didn't give up. We were able to move fast once we got it working and understood the sharp edges. We also learned some lessons from using GraphQL in this mobile project. Now, previously, we had both used GraphQL with a ClojureScript uh, web app with a Rails backend. But neither of us had used GraphQL with a React Native app. Uh, or with a closure backend. So in terms of discussing this, I think there are three important topics. There's how is it to use as a developer? How is the tooling around it? What is it like for the mobile client to use? And what is it like to implement a GraphQL server? First, tooling. So because GraphQL is typed and introspectable, tooling is incredibly good for such a young technology. So we'll look, a few, look at a few examples. This is called GraphQL Voyager. Uh, it's open source. And it produces interactive graphs of GraphQL schemas that you can sort of explore. This specifically is GitHub's API. Now, because GraphQL is a specification, this tool will work on any GraphQL API. You don't have to modify 
your API in any way to use this. This is called Graphical. This is another open source tool. This one was created by Facebook. Uh, in this video, we're accessing GitHub's API. You can see documentation on the right column, our query on the left-hand column, and the result of running that query in the middle. Again, because GraphQL is a specification, this tool will work with any GraphQL API. It's incredibly easy to use. For REST, something like Swagger is probably the high point in interactivity and documentation. And as you can see, GraphQL tools provide so much more leverage than REST tools can. So the lesson learned for us with this was that the GraphQL tooling ecosystem is really incredible and really helped us with our development speed. Now, <clears throat> probably the most important thing is what is it like for the mobile client? Mobile clients are very constrained. They are compute constrained, memory constrained, and network constrained. And GraphQL helps us deal with memory constraints by limiting overfetching. We don't have to pull all this extraneous data that we don't actually need into memory. It also helps a lot with network constraints, probably the most important constraint of these, and that allows us to consolidate a lot of uh, what would take many REST requests into one GraphQL request. Mobile clients are also very complicated, and as, as Lily has said, like, uh, the platform differences between iOS and Android, uh, OS version differences, screen dimensions, dynamic things like the keyboard, these make developing a mobile application in React Native even more complicated than developing a React uh, web application. And because of this, GraphQL is even more helpful in terms of using a good client because it allows us to simplify a lot of the client code. So to explain how GraphQL does this, or a GraphQL client does this, I'd like to relate it to React. So without React, you have something like this, where you manually have to update the UI. Now, fundamentally, what React does is it solves the problem of changing your UI from whatever it currently looks like to whatever you want it to look like. You don't need to like, remember what changed and figure out how to change it, or like, that, that whole problem disappears. A good GraphQL client like Relay or Apollo will solve a similar problem, but for data. It will solve uh, consolidating many requests into one, deduplicating data, notifying listeners of novelty, uh, updates including optimistic mutations. Now with REST, you might like, request a resource and then request and many related resources and then probably check permissions on all of those to see what you can display or what you should display to users. Uh, also, obviously, you're gonna want, because each of these are separate requests, you need to uh, check for failures and retry with probably some sort of exponential back off and like eventual cutoff and update local stores and notify whatever cares about it. Like it's, it's crazy. And this craziness is completely solved with uh, using GraphQL and a good GraphQL client library. And when you combine this with React, it's awesome. Uh, what happens is you get components that are either loading and have none of the data that they need, are loaded and have all of the data that they need, or they're, are, they're in an error state where there was a network failure or a server failure or something like that, and you choose whether to retry or display an error or whatever in that case. So it's, it's really difficult to overstate just how much client complexity we avoided by using this. It was definitely a huge win for us. So GraphQL makes the client sim simpler. Uh, what does it do for the server? In general, a GraphQL server is going to be more complex than a REST server. Now this does not apply if you already have a fairly complex data layer, uh, then GraphQL is not gonna add any complexity. Uh, but if you have a server, a REST server, which is essentially just like a minimal wrapper over a database schema where you're serving tables, uh, then this will add some complexity. There, like there has to be logic for connecting and understanding data, and in the REST case, that complexity resides with the client because the client has to connect and understand that data. But in the GraphQL case, the server understands connecting and understanding this data, and therefore that complexity is just moved back to the server. So this may sound like a bad thing, but I would posit that it's actually a very good thing because remember that we have clients that are very constrained. They're network, memory, compute constrained, and most importantly, 
those constraints are inconsistent and out of our control. So on the other hand, uh, our servers, way less constrained, and constraints are mostly in our control and mostly consistent. Now, this is a case of irreduci uh, irreducible complexity. It's not incidental. Like, it has to exist somewhere. Uh, and in the case of having to exist far away from the user, in, in this, like in this case, it doesn't harm the user. So we can locate it in our control and not harm the user. It, it's a win. Um, there's also incidental complexity that GraphQL adds, uh, unfortunately. So for example, you will probably be serving a GraphQL API from a single endpoint. And because of that, you can't use something like HTTP caching. You'll have to have a more sophisticated caching layer. Um, but overall, it's still, I think, a, a huge win. Now, this was our first time writing a GraphQL server in Clojure. And unfortunately, the ecosystem at the time wasn't that great. Uh, GraphQL CLJ does not implement large parts of the GraphQL specification, unfortunately, and we couldn't use it. GraphQL Java uh, is mostly complete, but it's buggy and it's like very, very Java. Um, <laughs> Uh, ultimately, we did end up wrapping GraphQL in Java uh, with Clojure, but it wasn't too fun. Um, Walmart also released uh, a library called Licinia recently. We can't use this yet. It's missing some uh, important features for us, like async and concurrent queries, but those are in the works, and overall it looks really good, and we're excited about Licinia. This was also the first time we used Atomic uh, with GraphQL, and it actually worked really well. Uh, in a GraphQL server, you ideally can do incremental data fetching and caching. And Datomic's Entity API makes incremental data fetching and caching really, really easy. So in comparison, something like this with SQL is, is like much more difficult to do. So in conclusion, in terms of the GraphQL stuff, uh, we reached out uh, outside of the Clojure and Clojure Script ecosystem. We used GraphQL Java, uh, Apollo Client. It wasn't particularly fun. But it wasn't too bad either. So really, like, don't be afraid of utilizing these huge ecosystems that Clojure and Clojure Script are built to interop with very easily. We also think that GraphQL is really awesome. And we, as Clojureans, would really benefit from embracing this emerging standard to a greater degree. So if you're deciding on data syncing techniques for your app, uh, I would definitely urge you to evaluate GraphQL for your needs. Uh, also, I created a GraphQL channel enclosure in Slack, so if, you, if, we, if I piqued your interest, uh, please do join and discuss. Because the combination of React Native, Expo, GraphQL, and ClojureScript was very new, the tooling around us was premature. We ended up breaking outside of Clojure and ClojureScript ecosystem and wrote wrapper for JS and Java libraries ourselves, and it's going fine. So we would love to see Clojure community embrace React Native and GraphQL more. Also, transitioning from the web to mobile wasn't that difficult. Most heavy lifting part has already been done by React Native. We thought that the React Native for Android alone would take us six months to implement, but we're able to deliver a feature-complete Android and iOS app in three months. This is a very powerful combination of technologies. But with still a lot of sharp edges. But as long as you can deal and learn to work with the sharp edges, it's totally worthwhile. Overall, we're very happy with it. <coughs> if you're curious to learn more about using ClojureScript with React Native, we have a blog post coming up on our website, paren.com. And thank you very much, and we'll be here off the question.